Thanks for coming. Delighted to see you all here. And let me thank Wendy and Delbert for inviting me to come and be part of this terrific cruise once again. I'm really happy to be here amongst uh, so many friends and so much great music. Um, I'm Scott Hubbard, uh, former director of NASA's Ames Research Center. Uh, along the way, I was able to have the great good fortune to be NASA's very first ever Mars program director, or as the media dubbed me, the Mars Czar. And I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of stories. Uh, those stories and more are in the book I wrote a couple of years ago called Exploring Mars, Chronicles from a Decade of Discovery. This part is called Exploring Mars, Following the Water. Why Mars? Because Mars is the most Earth-like of the other planets. And I think if we want to answer that fundamental human question of are we alone, did life ever emerge anywhere else, Mars is the place in our solar system to go look. Now, there's another place called Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. In the Q&A session, if you want to ask about that, we can, we can talk about it. But for right now, I think the focus for understanding whether or not life exists elsewhere in our solar system should be at Mars. Now, why water? Because water is absolutely fundamental to all life as we know it. Now, in the Q&A, again, if you want to ask about life as we don't know it, you know, you remember the Star Trek episode with the Horta? It's alive, Jim. Yeah. We can talk about that. But for all life as we know it, water is absolutely crucial. And by the way, water not only is crucial to life, but also the climate of a planet, its hard rock geology, and ultimately, human exploration, because you need to live off the land. You can't take everything with you. In the second half of the talk, I'll give you my thoughts about exploring Mars with people. But getting to Mars is hard. The moon is a few hundred thousand miles away. You can get there with rockets we have in about three days. Mars takes seven to nine months to get there. As the crow flies, if you had interplanetary crows, it would be about 140 million miles if you went direct. But you can't go direct. You have to follow the planet with a probe and then land, as you'll see. And that takes about 400 million miles. So since 1960, there have been 46 attempts to get to the red planet. And of those, if you're very generous, 12 have produced, I would say, some partial success, a few photographs, a few bits of data. Only 17 have been fully successful. And I'm counting the very recent mission called InSight that just landed to look for Mars earthquakes. So over the last 50 years, the odds of having a fully successful mission are about 36%. So in other words, it is very hard to get there. It is extremely challenging, and the engineering and the science are uh, really something that's extraordinary, and we'll, we'll get into that. How did I get to be the Mars czar? Well, about 20 plus years ago, there was this amazing announcement. It came out of the White House about a Mars rock, a Mars meteorite. There are about 100 of these, 100 meteorites that we know by matching gas that's trapped uh, that these are, in fact, from Mars. And a group of scientists, including one from Stanford, made the incredible announcement that they thought they saw evidence of fossilized life from Mars. And if you look at these little squiggly things here, they interpreted this as what they call nanofossils. Well, this was a big deal, obviously. Life preserved from Mars. So the administrator of NASA at the time embarked on an extraordinary push, a major campaign, to send missions to Mars at every opportunity, an orbit and a lander, every two years when the planets align just perfectly. The only catch was that he told the people uh, in NASA and the contractors, like Lockheed Martin, you've got to do it my way, Dan Golden's way, which was faster, better, cheaper. Now, anybody who's been involved in any kind of project, whether it's painting your house or going to Mars, knows that you can typically get two of the three without much problem. Uh, but if you want it faster, you usually have to spend more money. If you want it cheaper, you've got to take longer time and so forth. So he pushed Dan Golden, the administrator, the people at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Lockheed Martin to take uh, as quick a path as they could to get missions to Mars and as fast as possible then bring samples back. 
So 20 years ago, two missions were launched using this faster, better, cheaper philosophy, Mars Climate Orbiter, Mars Polar Lander, and they both failed. And they failed, it appeared, for different reasons. One of them, there was a mistake in converting English units to metric units. Uh, it was faster, but <laughs> it wasn't better. Uh, and the other one, they didn't have the time or the money, they thought, to test all the flight hardware with all the flight software. And that is a major mistake. So really, the source of the problems in both missions was attempting to do this on the cheap and way too fast. And so the big report came out, failure review report, and the chairman of that said, you know, there's all these problems in the Mars program, but one of the big problems is there's nobody in charge. You know, at least five people that said they're in charge, and clearly they can only be one. And so the administrator of NASA came to me, and he literally put his arm around me. He said, son, your country needs you. I want you to come to Washington, D.C. and fix the mess. Here, we're behind you a thousand percent. So I went to Washington, D.C., and over the next year, took a program that hit, was broken, had fallen apart, and built it back up from the ground. It was a science-driven effort. That was very important. The mission had been driven by Dan Golden's statement that we need to get there at every opportunity, but there wasn't a lot of thinking behind that. So we rebuilt the program with basic science principles about Mars as a system, the central question was, did life ever arise on Mars? And we came up with a simple way of explaining what we were doing, follow the water. Because as I said, water is so critical to all life as we know it. And after we went through this work with the industry, with academia, with all the people on Capitol Hill and every stakeholder, we ended up with this mission Q, Mars Global Surveyor, followed by Mars Odyssey followed by the twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, then the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, a mission called Phoenix to the North Pole of Mars, and finally, the Mars Curiosity, Mars Science Laboratory. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of those and what we've learned and how it fit into this queue, which came out of this strategic thinking process about how do you explore another world looking for the fingerprints of life. Almost immediately, the philosophy of follow the water began to be successful. This is now almost 20 years old. It came out of Science Magazine, very respected journal. And what they saw was evidence that looked like you'd had a flash flood on the surface of Mars. Now, this is on Earth. This is a flash flood in a volcanic region on Earth. And here was an area on Mars that looked almost identical. So evidence began to emerge in this new program 20 years ago, that there could be modern water on Mars. Now, Viking from the 1970s had seen evidence of ancient water two billion years ago. This was something that might have happened very, very recently. So this idea of look for the evidence of water was showing its results almost immediately. These are some other data that were taken by the early spacecraft, Mars Global Surveyor. What it shows in this blue on the left here is a large flat region at the pole, at the North Pole of Mars, which is where it looks like there may have been an ancient lake. And then on the right is a very interesting spot. See that, that greenish spot there? That's about the size of Connecticut. And what this is, if you interpret the information, is a mineral. It's a mineral that only appears on Earth after long exposure to water. So this said to us planning the program, aha, this is where we need to go and get some ground truth. It's one thing to orbit a planet and take images and take data. It's another thing to actually check that out by going to the surface. So the next mission in the list was another orbiter. And this orbiter had a very special instrument on it. I won't get into the details of how it works. It's not important. The main thing is to look at this color-coded diagram of Mars. This was an extraordinary surprise. People thought that in the top three feet, top meter of Mars, there might be some leftover ice or something from back when water was very prevalent 
what they saw was places near the North Pole and South Pole of Mars where, if this is accurate, you saw water in concentrations up to 80%. That means you could just dig a shovel in the ground and melt it, and you'd have liquid water all you wanted. Billions and billions and billions of tons of water ice frozen in the top three feet of Mars. And this mission uh, and the results of this mission were not expected. This was a, a huge surprise when they saw that data coming in, a huge peak that said, yes, massive water ice. So following the water, even in its ice form, was working, it seemed like, better and better. But now, let's go to the twin rovers. It's, as I said, one thing to take images from orbit, it's another to get to the ground. Previously, there had been a little small test demonstration called Mars Pathfinder, but that wasn't a real geological rover. These robots, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, were there with an instrument payload that would test for certain what kind of elements and compounds you could see on the surface of Mars. Um, the first one lasted seven years, eventually got caught in the equivalent of Mars quicksand. Second one, Opportunity, has been operating for 14 years. Now, I'll come back in a minute and tell you what's happening today. We don't know if it's ceased operations or not. We're listening for it, but I'll explain that in a second. The important point is that the warranty on this was only good for 90 days. Now, what do I mean by that? Whenever NASA launches a mission, you have to write down in advance what are your success criteria. You can't do this thing after the fact and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that thing you saw, that's, we planned that, right? You can't do that. You've got to write down in advance, signed by everybody, what are the criteria for success for a mission. Little mission, shuttle mission, all of them. So, in the success criteria that we wrote for this mission, we were very concerned about the dust on Mars. Mars is not only the red planet, it's the dusty planet. And that dust accumulates on everything. Since these were powered by solar panels, we figured that there's no way they're going to last more than about six months or so. In fact, I could not find anybody at all of NASA headquarters who thought they would last more than nine months. So we said, let's take that cut it in half, and say we must get our critical science measurements done in three months, in 90 days, 90 Mars days. Mars day is called a sol. It's a little bit longer than Earth's day. Let's get to Mars. Traveling, seven months, entering the atmosphere. You've got to slow down. You're going through what's known as the seven minutes of terror because you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. This is all pre-programmed. You're a couple of miles above the surface. You pop a supersonic parachute. The supersonic parachute slows you down to a few hundred miles an hour. Um, and then as you streak in toward the surface of the planet, again, trying to get rid of 12,000 miles an hour of energy and go to zero in seven minutes, you drop this little cocoon down on the end of a cable. And as you're coming closer and closer to the surface, you have to take out the side winds, but before you do that, you inflate the airbags. Now, I first proposed this idea over 20 years ago. It's been used three times. You fire the side rockets, the retro rockets, you cut the cable, and you bounce. And you bounce. Well, you probably won't use this for astronauts. <laughs> probably. So one of these bounced 20 times, the other bounced about 30 times. And the challenge that I was presented was, what's an inexpensive yet very robust and reliable way to get to the surface of Mars? And so this airbag technology, <coughs> which was first appearing in automobiles, was what was proposed. And uh, Spirit and Opportunity both used this. Once you get to the surface, then the next thing, of course, is to deflate the airbags and open the pedals. There's four pedals designed so no matter where it lands, you can make it upright, and then you open the pedals, and you unfold the solar panels. Because remember, you've been traveling now on battery power since you were released from what's called the cruise stage. You unfold the solar panels, you begin to get some power, recharge those batteries, and then 
What is any good robot supposed to do as soon as it gets to its first station, its first stop? Well, yeah, it's, it's supposed to not only take a look around and send back a picture, but it's supposed to phone home. So there's that little paddle is an, an antenna saying, hi, I'm here, I'm all right, everything's fine. So this is the process that we used for multiple missions to get to the surface of Mars. But what have we discovered? What we've discovered is many more pieces of evidence of past water. These little ripples that you see, a person who's an expert in rivers and uh, other types of water would say this is evidence of slowly moving water over a long period of time. But we also found this. Now, you remember that thing we saw from orbit, that Connecticut-sized yellow-green area that I said was a mineral that only occurs on Earth after long exposure to water? Spirit and Opportunity confirmed that what we were seeing from 300 miles up were these little berries of this mineral uh, that are always associated with liquid water. Millions and millions and millions of these little berries was what you were seeing from orbit. So this is the whole idea of exploring another world. You orbit, you get information, you go and get drowned truth on the surface. But 14 years, or seven years, when the warranty was only good for 90 days, how do you do that? You know, what's, what's going on here? Well, here is a time-lapse photograph of dust devils on Mars. One day in the control room, the power was going down and down because the dust was collecting on the solar panels, and then whoop, it jumped up to almost 100%. So the operators of the two rovers said, well, what's going on here? So what they did was starting to take time-lapse photographs of the area. And what they discovered were these dust devils that would occasionally come by. You know, if you're a, a weatherman on Mars, in addition to giving the temperatures, and you know, it's minus 110 tonight and plus 14 tomorrow, uh, they would say, and the probability of dust devils is about 40%. Because at this latitude, like the high desert, they're very common. And they cleaned off the rover. Now, I have been in the space business for over 45 years, and there is something that many of you have probably heard of called Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. This is the only time <laughs> nature ever helped me. Uh, because, indeed, the reason that these rovers have lasted so long is because of good engineering, sure, uh, but the dust devils cleaning off the solar panels. But what uh, nature giveth, nature can taketh away. And in June of last year, there occurred a weeks-long, several months-long dust storm. These aren't very common, but they're known, and they occur on Mars every few years. A global dust storm. So this is, if you were uh, looking up from the uh, Opportunity rover toward the sky, you would see the sun on the left through a dark sky, and as the dust storm got worse and worse and worse and worse, that's what you would see, essentially nothing. No sunlight coming down and dust everywhere. That's the point where we lost contact with opportunity. And it's been out of contact since June. Most of the thinking is that this global dust storm covered the solar panels with so much dust that it can't get enough power to recharge the batteries. But NASA is still listening, They'll continue to listen, uh, until the end of this month, and then they'll decide if they're going to continue or not. But I would say 14 years versus three months, all you taxpayers got your money's worth. Now, back up to orbit for a minute. This is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It is our spy satellite around Mars. It's capable of a resolution down to size about this big or so. And this is an example of the kind of pictures it has taken. It's taken images of all of the rovers that are uh, currently on Mars, including some from years ago. And the very high resolution of this orbiter allows us to tell what is caused by wind versus what's caused by water. And this mission has given us some extraordinary new findings. And let me just point out a few of those. One is, uh, a little over a year ago, the finding of a gigantic glacier the size of New Mexico. If you melted all the water in this glacier, it would fill Lake Superior. 
Now, this was done through what's called ground penetrating radar. So this radar goes from orbit down into the ground of Mars and bounces back. And by interpreting that data that comes back, you can tell what it interacted with. So here's this gigantic glacier underneath the surface, slightly underneath the surface of Mars, the massive amount of water ice. And this is, again, showing how follow the water has paid off by looking for those that evidence of water in all its various forms, we continue to follow the trail that we think will lead us to the footprints, the fingerprints of life. Um, just a year ago, when I was on uh, this cruise in this very room a year ago, I announced something that had just been published the day before, which was seeing ice cliffs 300 feet tall. So the, this orbiter took a picture from the side, saw that cliff on the left, put it through some processing, and discovered that there is about six inches of dust. Then the soil, remember I showed you that picture of uh, blue at the poles, up to 80% water ice? Then that's been confirmed again. Uh, Ice-rich soil, three to six feet. And then massive ice, up to 300 feet deep. That's the, uh, the schematic on the right in the picture. In the, center, in the center of the, uh, of the chart there. Again, showing this enormous reservoir of water that was there on Mars and is now frozen. But what about liquid water? This just came out in July. So six months ago, uh, a European mission called Mars Express, which has a different kind of radar, uh, made by the same science group, but two different frequencies. It's two different kinds of penetration. They published results showing a liquid water lake about 12 miles across, 20 kilometers wide, about maybe a mile or so under the surface. So this is now a major breakthrough. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Can we see evidence of liquid water on Mars? And we've finally seen it. So it takes a few years from when I first said follow the water uh, in uh, the year 2001 until now, but this sequence of missions <clears throat> that are international uh, have found that first bit of evidence. I expect this group is going to be publishing more and more uh, data that looks like this. Now, that's terrific news from orbit, but what about the ground truth again? What about really confirming that that stuff that you see near the surface is, in fact, uh, water ice? So a mission was sent called Phoenix about 10 years ago. It landed near the North Pole of Mars, which if you remember that picture, it showed up to 80% water ice. Well, they found it. They dug up the soil, and you see these little rocks down in the left-hand corner here. They're up in that expanded picture up there, and those little pieces of ice were taken into the onboard laboratory and confirmed to be water ice. So indeed, the things that we've seen from orbit about all of that water in the form of ice are indeed true. So the next mission, the last one in the queue that I personally put into place, is the Mars Science Laboratory. Now here's the family tree here, uh, the growth of rovers. The little bitty one there is the Mars Pathfinder, weighed about 40 pounds or so. The middle one, Spirit and Opportunity. We just saw how they got to the surface and why they've lasted so long. Those are about 300 pounds or so, sort of a small golf cart size. The one on the far left is Curiosity. The Mars Science Laboratory rover it weighs a metric ton. So uh, about 1,800 pounds, equipped with the most sophisticated laboratory that we've ever sent to another world. Uh, how do you get a 1,800-pound rover, which is you know sort of John Deere truck size, to the surface of Mars? Turns out that the airbag technique won't work. You can't scale it up big enough. So instead, what uh, the engineering staff presented to me uh, and what we looked at was something that you'll see in just a second. This is where it's going, or where it went, Gale Crater. Um, and the reason that Gale Crater was picked is because it's like a time machine. So this crater was gouged out two billion years ago by some huge impact, and then filled in over time. And over time, 
the uh, uh, material that filled in would give you from the earliest as you drove up the mountain to the latest material, and that would tell us about the history of Mars. So that's why Gale Crater was picked. So how do you get there? Well, you use something called a sky crane. Same supersonic parachute, but this time guided entry so that you can be very accurate. And then, just above the surface, you drop off the rocket-powered helicopter. And so you have a mothership that's carrying the rover down to the surface. As you get just above the surface, maybe 30, 40 feet, you lower the rover down to about one meter per second, about like that. Gently to the surface. Cut the cables. Mothership flies away, and then you have this extremely sophisticated rover sitting on the surface of Mars. It comes equipped with uh, a truly amazing set of instrumentation. I'll just let this run for a minute so you can see one of the first ones. This is a way of examining rocks to determine which ones you want to take a sample of. Um, this has a very uh, elaborate name. It's got a very uh, sophisticated camera on the surface that looks around, examines everything in the field of view, looks for interesting rocks, then goes and drives over to it. The thing in the back is a radioisotope power supply. Uh, we knew that long term having solar panels would not be a good idea because of the dust. So in this rover, which was built a number of years later, we were able to incorporate this uh, radioactive power supply that means it's got very long life, 15 years or so maybe. So once a rock of interest is identified, and pictures taken of it. Then we use what's called the zapper. This is all done through software instructions that are sent up to the robot, then it does it uh, autonomously. So what you can do by hitting this with a laser and evaporating the surface of it is you can get an, a spectra. You can get information about what are the elements in that rock, and that will tell you whether that rock is worth following up with more measurements or not. So this is where, as I said, Curiosity is going. It's something that's been labeled Mount Sharp. And uh, the mountain is the result of two billion years worth of material built up. And so it acts like a time machine as you drive from where you landed, which is the oldest part up the side of the mountain, you get to younger and younger surfaces. So what has been found, um, first of all, the first, almost the first drill hole showed that there was a, a past habitable environment. Didn't say that it found life, but they said if life were there, it would be able to survive. And they found very simple organics. Now this is sort of like cleaning fluid here, chlorobenzene. Don't worry about the, the uh, biochemistry name, just that it's a simple organic, because we're going to come back to that in a second. And then the weather and analysis, uh, environmental analysis, shows that there has been a water cycle. A water cycle, very briny water, very salty water, but indications of water going on in recent times uh, from being evaporated, coming back down, maybe as a snow or frost, then being evaporated again. We've also found methane. Um, now, uh, this is what the burps look like. Uh, on Earth, methane, as many of you know who have been on farms, you get a lot of methane from cows, yes. I'm not saying there's Martian cows. Hey, don't run off to the National Enquirer. <laughs> Mars R says Mars cows, no. Um, there are two ways to make methane. One, on the right, is using the heat from the underground, from what's left over from the uh, molten core of Mars, heating water, and that water going through some chemistry and coming out is methane. But there is also a way of making methane with biology. 
And the fact that this rover has sniffed this periodically, not all the time, it seems to burp from somewhere, probably underground, coming up through a fissure. This is an extremely intriguing measurement <clears throat> that needs to be followed up in the near future. But the most amazing thing that was just published just a few months ago is the following. What, as I said, the rover had found in the past was very simple organic materials. You know, organic materials, things with carbon in them, are the building blocks of all life as we know it. That organic material, that material with carbon plus water and energy equals a living system. So these simple molecules <coughs> that we see here are interesting and I'll show you what they're called in a second, but they don't tell you whether or not there might have been living material there. So I'm going to start a little animation. It'll go by fairly quickly, and you'll see the difference between what we knew a few years ago and what we know today. So this material on the, the right is propane, which you barbecue with, and now this is what they've found. Just published a few months ago, something called kerogen. What do we know about kerogen on Earth? Kerogen is what's left over from algae and woody plants, trees, trees and algae that fall and are preserved and go through some uh, degradation process. That's what turns into kerogen. So maybe, just maybe in the past, we had some simple organisms, maybe even some trees and plants growing on Mars. Again, the kind of extraordinary result that we've been waiting for for years, and that's why this mission was built, was to look for this kind of result. So where are we today <coughs> with respect to the science? I would say for ancient life, the potential has increased dramatically. We really now have the water, water ice. Looks like a liquid water lake. We have organic material. We have energy. So. Ancient life, I think, is a, becoming a greater possibility. And what we need to do now is to bring some samples back. Modern life, maybe. The methane is intriguing. That needs to be followed up on. Um, as a minimum, though, what we see is that Mars is far more diverse than anybody ever thought when we started this program about 20 years ago. So I think the next step is from follow the water to seeking the signs of life, and ultimately, affordable human exploration. And I'll come to that in the next section. Before we do, though, the next science mission, I was talking to some of you about what's next. What's next is to go to the surface, collect some samples, very carefully selected samples, bring those to orbit, and bring them back to Earth. Because on Earth, we can take a sample, we can examine it in hundreds of laboratories with thousands of scientists. They can cross-check each other's results. It really is a, a very, very powerful tool and would represent a big step in our knowledge about Mars. So the um, next step has been approved. It's under construction. Uh, if you went to uh, JPL in Pasadena, California, you could see there on the floor in the clean room how they're putting this, this rover together. So this is a really, really uh, amazing next step, and it will launch in just a little over a year from now to Mars. <clears throat> That's all science. And whenever I give a talk like this, people invariably say, yes, fascinating. Did life ever uh, emerge on Mars? Want to know that, but when are people going to go? So this next section, I'm going to give you my thoughts. These are not endorsed by NASA or anybody else, uh, but it's my thoughts on sending people to Mars. So for decades, when I was on a radio show or being interviewed by Bryant Gumbel or Katie Couric or somebody, they would uh, say, well, when are we going to send people to Mars? And I'd say, well, there's about five big showstoppers that we've got to deal with. Why not just send robots? Why do we need people there? What are they going to do? What about the biomedical issues? You've got radiation. You've got microgravity. Ah, what about the hardware? I mean, the Saturn V is long gone, and that's what we use to send Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. And can you make this affordable? Is it going to take the entire national budget, or could you do it within what NASA is already getting, plus maybe inflation? So in the past, I would raise these 
as big questions, maybe even showstoppers, but I think today I would give a very different answer. Let's talk about what people can do and what humans can do. So opportunity over the last 13, 14 years has driven uh, about 25 miles. It's made hundreds of measurements, but it cannot collect any rocks. By comparison, Apollo 17, the last Apollo mission, drove roughly the same distance in 20 hours, not 13 years, collected uh, about uh, 200 pounds of rocks and brought them back. Now, the difference in expense <laughs> was huge. You know, the Spirit and Opportunity cost about, I don't know, a billion and a half dollars. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo cost over a hundred billion dollars. Uh, in, you know, that was, of course, 50 years ago. But uh, what about the science results of that? Well, my friend Steve Squires, who's the uh, principal scientist for Spirit and Opportunity, has made the following statement. He said, it takes a rover a day to do what a field geologist could do in 45 seconds. So he did a test with a bunch of well-known Mars scientists, had them, uh, when he clicked the stopwatch, go out, collect a rock, and tell them what it was. And they could do that in under a minute. It takes a rover all day to do that. So if you had people there, they could be very efficient, very effective in making observations and figuring out where the best place is to go and look for the fingerprints of life. But what about all those radiation effects and microgravity and all that stuff? You're in weightlessness, traveling to Mars, exposed to the environment for seven months or so. Well, this was now um, just about four years ago. The chief medical officer for NASA, Rich Williams, made the following statement. He said, there are no crew health risks at this time that are considered mission stoppers for humans to Mars. That's a very bold statement, and we can talk about it in a little bit if you want to. But what he's saying is we have learned enough about how people react and the countermeasures to that that he felt, as the chief medical officer, safe in saying it was now acceptable risk, this is all about acceptable risk, to send humans to Mars. Okay, that's the second item. New space hardware. NASA is building something called a space launch system be roughly a Saturn V replacement, um, and a deep space capsule called Orion. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, commercial crew flights will start this year sometime. Now, full disclosure, I serve as the chairman of the commercial crew safety advisory panel for SpaceX. So I'm going to show you a bunch of SpaceX stuff that they've uh, let me use. And uh, I think it's very compelling about what one entrepreneur has been able to achieve. Uh, the commercial cargo program that's underway has been highly successful. And the reason you do this is this. If you were to build Elon Musk's Falcon 9 and Dragon capsule using standard government procurement procedures, it would cost you, on the left, about $4 billion. Elon Musk put about 400 million in, NASA put about 400 million in, and for less than a billion dollars, the U.S. now has an entrepreneur providing a whole new launch vehicle and a whole new space capsule. That's the power of what can happen once the investment is done in the advanced technology, and then an entrepreneur takes that and goes to the next step and turns it in almost to a production line. So I think for NASA, if you used all the things I just described, <clears throat> the hardware that's currently being developed, the savings from groups like SpaceX and Boeing, developed only the new stuff you absolutely need, my view, use the moon only for intermediate testing, not as a, a base, and you broke the program into two pieces. First, learn how to get to Mars in orbit and then land. Um, and you took the money from supporting the space station and you backed away from that in 2024 or 2028, then using just the money that NASA has for its human spaceflight program today, with inflation, you could orbit Mars with people in about uh, 14 years from now and land them in 2039. I do believe that this is possible, and I think the risk factors have all come down significantly. So that's, that's a pretty... Uh, ambitious goal. I think it's doable. We can talk 
a little bit more if you want about what are the political obstacles. But let me just make the point that NASA, as I said, is not the only game in town today. SpaceX has their own vision for getting people to Mars. Uh, what SpaceX is trying to do is to get a greater overlap between people who want to go and people who can afford to go. And to do that, SpaceX, and Elon Musk in particular, has said he wants to get the cost of going to Mars one way. <laughs> yeah, you got to put that in, right? Yeah. Before you sign up, <laughs> at about $140,000. That's within the realm of at least some uh, extreme adventure types. Um, to do that, uh, and to actually build a settlement, I mean, when pressed, uh, Elon will say, yes, yes, we will provide you with a ticket home if you want to come back. Uh, he says, these four things are absolutely necessary to building an affordable Mars settlement. Full reusability, refilling in orbit, and then uh, a bunch of chemistry about the right propellant. Um, so to do that, he has put forward in public what he calls his BFR, which he says stands for the Big Falcon Rocket. Uh, he, there might be other words, but <laughs> we'll just say it's the big Falcon rocket, all right? And this thing is a monster. Uh, you're talking about 40 cabins with a huge pressurized volume, uh, gigantic fuel tanks with uh, both uh, methane and uh, liquid oxygen. It chooses those because you could make those on Mars with what we already know is there. Uh, and then, you know, sophisticated engines and so forth. I'll let this run just a little bit more so you can see part of the dream here or part of the engineering plan, which is refilling it from a, a drone spacecraft in orbit. And you see how the transfer of methane and oxygen would occur. The rocket itself is way over on the right. It would have more capability than the Saturn V. 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit. That's gigantic. Um, and the goals, I mean, this is what, I mean, Elon himself admits that he is guilty of uh, aspirational goals, he calls them. But he said he would like to send an unmanned version in 2022 and send people in 2024. Now, in the past, his predictions have slipped, but I think it's a, a noteworthy goal to lay out there to push the whole system. <clears throat> so this next piece here... Um, you might be able to see by streaming, but uh, SpaceX has given me, allowed me to take a copy of it so I can show it to you here on the ship. This is the launch uh, of the Falcon 9 Heavy, including its very special payload, uh, which is, you'll, you will see Starman in a Tesla Roadster, uh, and part of the other engineering dream, which is to show reusability. Okay, here we go. It's a god awful small affair to the girl with the mousy hair. But her mummy is yelling no, and her daddy has told her to go. But her friend is nowhere to be seen. Now she walks through her sunken dream to the seat with the clearest view. And she's hooked to the silver screen But the film is a sad thing for For she's lived it ten times or more She could spit in the eyes of fools If they ask her to focus on The this their life on Mars. This isn't computer graphics, folks. This is real. All right, watch this. Watch this. This is unbelievable. Two first stages coming down simultaneously. 
Wow. Made on Earth by humans. Starman and his Tesla Red Roadster are now circling an orbit roughly the same as that of Mars around the sun, and will be for millions of years. So what do we do? We put all this together. Where we are today is that Mars is on the surface, dry, apparently dead, but we know from all of this huge amount of scientific data that in the past it had abundant liquid water on the surface, and we know that it's still there in the form of water ice, that there may be liquid lakes, maybe life migrated to that if it formed on the surface. So in the future, can we do this? Can we go? Can we build a base? Can we live there? Can we explore? Can we look for life? My friends, I think we can do this. Thank you. So we've got 10-15 uh, minutes. I'd be happy to take some questions. Do you know the pressure and or temperature of the liquid water you found? All we really know is that the reflections of the radio waves, of the radar, uh, when they've been polarized, and I won't get into all the technical detail, but when they've been modified and come back, indicate a reflection surface that's got what's called the dielectric. It's got the characteristics of liquid water. Now, a friend of mine, I'm not an expert in um, this type of radar measurement, but I have a friend, uh, Charles Elashi, who was the director of the Jet Propulsion Lab, who is, um, and uh, he said he'd seen the raw data, and he thinks beyond a doubt that they have found a liquid water lake. Uh, now, it would have to be to be liquid, and that place, kilometer below the surface, it would probably be very, very briny, which case it has suppressed, uh, depressed the, uh, the melting point, the freezing point. And so you have a situation where, uh, you know, the, mo the water is probably less than 32 Fahrenheit, you know, zero degrees, uh, but is not frozen because of the presence of all these salts. But we don't know that. That's just sort of um, extrapolation from the measurement we do have. The thought of uh, dwellings at first, is it to burrow into cliffs and to avoid radiation? And what's involved with, with hardware to bur burrow into the, into the rock and, and tunnel out? And, or is it still safe enough to just build these bubbles on the surface where radiation comes right in? What's the kind of the calculation on that kind of thing? Yeah, if you were going to have a safe habitat on the surface of Mars, even though Mars has an atmosphere, the moon does not. So if you're going to build a, uh, a habitat on the moon, it would have to be even more resistant to radiation. Mars has an atmosphere that does filter out some of the radiation, but you would almost inevitably, if not be below grade, you would use some of what's called the regolith, some of the dirt and rocks of Mars to cover your habitat in order to shield it. Uh, it would also have to be one that had a vacuum seal of some sort because the atmosphere, even though it exists, is very, very thin. It's like Earth at 100,000 feet. And so uh, you would need to live inside of a pressurized module as well. And there are a lot of complications that would have to be dealt with, like the dust and so forth. But I think it's pretty safe to say that you are going to, uh, to have uh, either be underground or build something on the surface and then pile a lot of Mars rock and dirt on top of it. Yeah, you need to send robotic diggers, and you know I'm sure that that you know Caterpillar or somebody is working on a proposal right now. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. I un if I understood correctly, um, next year you're la we're launching a probe that's looking to bring back rocks from the surface of Mars. Is that so, that, so in 2020, it, the first part of a three-part mission okay. will get launched, and this is the rover that will have the ability to drill out cores and put them in canisters and save them for another mission that will come and pick them up and then take them back. Do we know how that's going to happen yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah get, Physically get them back, you know, all the way back to Earth. Yeah, no, so the first step is to s select these samples, very carefully selected samples using the best science we can, put them in sealed canisters, and then position those canisters so they can be easily found. 
Then another mission, I didn't get into this because of time constraints, would go and land on the surface and then probably, this is one architecture, have what's called a fetch rover that would go out and grab the samples and bring it back to a waiting rocket. So now comes the really interesting and tricky part of the whole mission is to load those samples into the nose cone of a rocket that would launch from the surface of Mars and rendezvous with a waiting orbiter. Okay, and then that waiting orbiter would turn around and return to Earth. And so it takes all three parts to make this work. It's a very daunting engineering challenge, and that's why it hasn't been done up to now. But I think that the uh, risks and issues are well understood, and now it's a matter of, of doing the development. Other questions? Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am, over here. And then we'll come to you. Yeah, so the question is, what's the global participation in all these projects? Um, science exploration has always been international. Uh, we've flown U.S. instruments on European missions and vice versa for 50 years or more. There are currently a couple of international missions orbiting Mars. I mean, no one has successfully landed on Mars and conducted all the science that the U.S. has, but both India um, and uh, the European Space Agency uh, currently have missions that are in orbit around Mars. And I expect that sort of collaboration to continue. Um, in terms of human exploration, uh, if the path that I laid out that NASA might follow uh, were to continue uh, with all the various parts that need to be created, uh, it's my assumption and prediction that you would have international partners stepping up to say, okay, European Space Agency, we can build this piece. And uh, some other partner like Japan saying we'll be this piece, just like they did for the International Space Station. So that's the path that NASA and other countries uh, could well follow. There's a lot of precedent for it. 16 different countries have collaborated in building the International Space Station. So there's a desire by other nations to do this. They just don't have the wherewithal to provide leadership the way the U.S. does. Yep. Yeah, there's one right there. What's the size of Mars compared to Earth? Sure. So the size of Mars is about half that of Earth. And it aged much more rapidly because of that. And its gravity is about three-eighths of Earth's gravity. So as the planet cooled off, it lost its magnetic fields, which meant that its atmosphere began to be stripped away. The volcanoes went away, as far as we can tell. So the atmosphere was not replaced. And all of that comes about because the planet is significant, is, is half the size. The current atmosphere, as I mentioned a minute ago, is about like Earth at 100,000 feet. It's very thin, mostly carbon dioxide. So let's stop there. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here.